Open your Bibles this morning, Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to, this morning, do something a little different. I know we're in the book of Romans, I understand that, but you know what? We have a whole Bible in front of us, and you know, every once in a while I take off on a little detour like this because of, of, the, of necessity, that's why I do it. You know, there are verses in Paul's epistles that people misunderstand and they give certain people the impression that you can lose the salvation that you have if you don't do the right thing. If you don't obey certain things or walk a certain way. And the verse that I would like to discuss with you today is a verse that probably no other verse has ever had more, has ever been more frequently the battleground of discussion than the verses that we'll look at today. I asked you to remember Meribee on the board. Meribee joined us about a year ago, and now she's on our online family, and she's totally dedicated to the Word of God, as many other of our family here and our online family are. And she's been sharing the Word of God with many people. I mean, she is a vocal human being. And she talks to everybody. And she finally struck gold. Finally, some of the people she's been sharing the Word of God rightly divided with for the past several months have come to see the light. And now they're on fire. And now they're watching videos non-end. They're binging, okay? Watching the Word of God rightly divided. So a couple of them recently were in a church that doesn't rightly divide, and they asked the pastor about eternal security what he thought about eternal security. And she told me that he basically said that eternal security is nonsense. It's nonsense. And then he quoted Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, Paul is speaking, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And to that man, this means that you can lose your salvation if you do not keep up a certain standard of living. And to a person who doesn't believe in the eternal salvation of the soul, this verse means you can lose what you have in Christ. Now, I try to understand why people think the way they do. What makes them say the things they say. And it's obvious in this verse that he's associating the word work with keeping your salvation. In other words... You're saved by grace apart from the works of the law. You can't be saved by working for it. We know that. If he reads Paul's epistles, and I don't know if he does, because there are people who actually say Paul doesn't belong in the Bible. I mean, there are, peop there are people in Christendom who actually say Paul doesn't belong in the Bible. And yet they say the Bible is the inspired word of God. You know, so they're confused about a couple of things. But if he reads Paul, he knows that salvation is a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You don't deserve it. But, but, after you're saved, after you've received this free gift, according to him, you have to do good works to keep your salvation because although it was the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for your sin, 
and gave himself on your behalf and took God's wrath in your place and it's he who died and was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures although all of that was completed on God's side after all that God has done to ensure your salvation this man says that you are responsible for keeping your salvation to keep in good standing with God. What you do after you're saved will either determine whether or not you remain saved. What kind of a salvation is that? That is the common teaching among those who believe that a person once saved can lose their salvation. That's the common understanding of people who don't understand the cross work of Jesus Christ was provided to us by the eternal God and produced an eternal redemption on our behalf. So obviously, the works mentioned in this verse have nothing to do with working for your salvation at all. The verse says, work out your salvation. So in order to understand verse 12, those of you who know me know that there's something else you'll have to understand. What am I talking about? Context. You'll have to understand the context. This, no verse is an island by itself. Okay? So the context of the, of the chapter, even of the book of Philippians, is unity in the body of Christ. And the context of the chapter is both individual application and also body application, body of Christ application. There's an application to us individually. There's a body of Christ application as a whole. So Paul is speaking to you individually, but he's also speaking to the body of Christ. Notice in verse one, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, notice, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. It's all of them, the whole body collectively, and yet the whole body collectively is made up of individual believers and therefore all of the things he says apply to the body but they apply to us individually. Because I heard somebody say once that some of the verses in Philippians apply to the body collectively as though the body wasn't made up of individuals. The body's made up of individuals. Okay, so again the context of the Philippian epistle is unity in the body among the members of the body. So notice in chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy. How? That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So in these verses, Paul spells out the responsibility of members in the body of, of Christ. Now he's going to give you an example of what Jesus Christ did for the body of Christ. Ephesians 2, uh, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ was equal with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The triune God manifested in one person but made himself of no reputation. He's giving us an example of what Christ did in his life in accordance with what he just said about being of the same mind, like-minded, not looking on 
look, not looking on yourselves but on others, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He did the ultimate thing. The Most High God humbled himself. He condescended to men of low estate. And how low did he go? And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then after he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, God did something. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Those of you who hear me pray, no, I always end my prayers with that verse right there. In that name which is above every name. That's, that's where I get that, right? Now before we look at the next verses, you have your Bibles in front of you, and I hope people online have their Bibles in front of them, because I want you to see something. The first thing that is this, okay? Number one, I want you to remember who Paul is speaking to. Okay? He's speaking to the body of Christ. He's not talking to the world. He's not talking to people who have no interest in God, or the things of God, or people outside the, the, the body of Christ. He's not talking to them. He's talking to us. And then the next thing I want you to notice is that verse 12 begins with the word wherefore. Wherefore. Or in light of what I just said. So what did he just say? Well, notice verse 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What Paul is talking about in this verse, which almost every grace preacher that I know agrees that this is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. That's when this will happen. Every knee will bow. Okay. At the judgment seat of Christ, believers are not judged for sin. Your sin is gone. Your sin is taken care of. The cross paid for your sin. Past, present, and future. So thank the Lord for that. So at the cross, forgiveness of sin was applied to your life. Not at the cross, but by the cross when you believe, right? When you believe the gospel of your salvation, that's when you received the forgiveness of sin. At the judgment seat of Christ, after the church is caught out of here, believers are judged for service. Their service is what they're judged for, and your service is directly related to your doctrine. I will take that as far, uh, I will take that this far. There's only one verse in the Word of God that tells you how to study your Bible. We know what that verse is, I don't even have to quote it, <laughs> right? What verse is it? Titus what? I know, I'm joking, folks online. They, they all said 2 Timothy 2.15, okay? So, what you do with the Word of God is based on that verse. Most people, most people who are saved agree that at the judgment seat of Christ, no one is being judged for, for their sin. Most people agree with that. Not all people understand the judgment seat of Christ. But our sins are gone. People are judged at the judgment seat of Christ based on their service for God. There are people who don't understand what their service for God is, so they say that rewards are given at the judgment seat of Christ. I actually heard a man say this this past week for how well he's fulfilling the Great Commission. Okay, well, you know we're not fulfilling the Great Commission today. We have a greater commission from our apostle who said, I speak to you Gentiles. So 
But in verses 10 and 11 is the judgment seat of Christ. It's in light of that truth that Paul begins verse 12 with wherefore. In light of, in light of that, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Paul is absent, right? Where is he? That's right. When he writes this, he's in prison. They're missing him. It was great when he was around. It's always great when the preacher's around. You know, people get to rely on their preacher sometimes way, way, way too much. There have been times in church history, in the 1500s, there was a thing in England where all preachers were put in prison. And their people were left to themselves. And when those preachers got out, guess what? Their people were still there. Sometimes people do rely too much on the preachers for their edification and for their teaching. Sometimes it's almost a slavish dependence upon a man when your responsibility is to the Word of God yourself. He says, but now much more in my absence, because he knows his absence is going to be, he's going to be missed. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that one day you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give account for your service to the gospel of the grace of God. We will give an account to the word of God, how we handled the word of God. So we're exhorted to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So notice that phrase, work out your own salvation. Now in order to understand these words, let's first understand what they don't mean. Let's first understand what Paul is not saying. Because I said this frequently in my ministry, in order to understand something in the Bible, sometimes it's easier to understand what it's not talking about, and then you can readily understand what it is talking about. Okay, so notice this verse is not saying, work for your salvation. <laughs> it's not saying that. No, right? Paul is not exhorting the people at, at the church of Philippi to produce their own salvation. Rather, he's exhorting them to work out the salvation that they already possess. They already own this salvation. Okay? It's a personal possession. Paul is writing to people who are saved. Remember in chapter 1, verse 1, he said that they're in Christ. These people are in Christ. Nowhere in Paul's epistles does he ever say that salvation will be the result of a work that you have done. Jesus Christ did the work. I've just received that to myself by faith and believing that he did that. You know, he said in the first chapter, he thanks God for their fellowship in the gospel. People, Paul's not going to thank the world for their fellowship in the gospel. They're trying to kill him. <laughs> Paul understands their fellowship in the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking to people who a good work has begun in them. Paul is concerned about us working out that good work which was begun in us. He wants us to work it out of us. Working out your salvation. So what does that mean? Well, in order to understand it, we really have to know what that salvation is that he's talking about. Because not every time you see the word salvation in the word of God, is it referring to justification by faith? Not always referring to that. I mean, is he talking about the salvation like you have where you're justified by faith and you're standing in the grace of God? Like, remember these verses? 
Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have, we have a hope that we're rejoicing in, that we're looking forward to when we will participate in the glory of God one day and the, His glory will be revealed in us. Notice this verse, as members of the body of Christ who are saved, our salvation is likened to standing in the grace of God. You know, I, I love the illustration of a wheel. A wheel has a hub with spokes attached to the wheel. And no matter where the hub goes, it's always going to be in the center of the wheel. Always. It can't be anywhere else. It goes up a wall, it's going to be in the center. It goes on straight, it's going to be in the center. We're standing in the grace of God. We're in the center of the grace of God. And no matter where I move, I'm always in the center of the grace of God. I can't change that position in Christ. I can't change it. It's not based on what I do. It's based on what he did. Okay? So every time you see salvation, it's not always referring to your standing in Christ. It's not always referring to that. In, in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 18, Paul said, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, for I know that this will turn to my salvation through your prayer. Was Paul saying that he wasn't saved and through their prayer he's going to get saved? Well, that could not possibly be. I mean, so the important question that you have to ask yourself when you see the word salvation in the word of God is what salvation is it speaking of? I mean, an understanding of Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 hinges on you knowing what salvation Paul is speaking of. You want to share that? What, what happened? Nothing? Oh. I thought I said something funny. No? Oh. So let me repeat that. An understanding of Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 hinges on you knowing and understanding what salvation Paul is speaking of. To go wrong here is to go wrong in your understanding of that verse and end up with a works-oriented, PBA, performance-based acceptance, salvation. Salvation has different meanings in the Word of God. And we won't look at all of them, but you remember in Exodus when Israel was running from Pharaoh's army. And they arrived at the Red Sea, and the waves of the Red Sea are foaming at their feet. And they look back, and they're angry at Moses for having brought them there to that place. And Moses says this to them. And Moses said unto the, unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. That salvation was deliverance from an enemy. And most of the, the time you see salvation under the old economy in the Old Testament, it has to do with them being delivered from some sort of trouble called the salvation of the Lord. Nothing to do with justification unto eternal life whatsoever. So we already looked at salvation from the penalty of sin. But looking back at these verses, what then, Philippians 1.18, what then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For I know that this will turn to my salvation through your prayer 
I'm going to say this again. Was Paul saying that he wasn't saved and through their prayer he ultimately was going to get saved? No, of course not. You know, that would be foolish to even think that. Obviously, Paul is saved. Paul is in prison. He's going through difficult times. He's probably chained to a Roman soldier. He says in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Notice he says that in nothing I shall be ashamed, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. I'm not going to be ashamed. Basically, in other words, his strength from the supply of the Spirit of Christ would enable him to not be ashamed, and that is what turned to his salvation, the salvation of just being delivered from that kind of thinking even, from discouragement even. Not that he was going to be saved. You know, the same, we use that word frequently, saved, as in justification by faith. But notice also in chapter 1, verse 27, he said, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. I said at the beginning of this that Philippians, the context is unity. Unity in this, in this group of people, striving together for the faith. But notice verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Notice that there are adversaries. So the salvation spoken of here is that they're not afraid of their adversaries and the adversaries in those days, just like in our day, are fierce and vicious and hateful. People who hate the gospel hate it with a venomous hatred. So when they see that you're not afraid because of what you have in you, because of the word of God working effectually in them that believe, that is an evident token to them of perdition. God will judge them. Somehow, instinctively, they know that. Whether they believe it or not, somehow, in the conscience of man. He's hoping it won't happen. He's hoping somehow he will escape it. But he knows somehow inside. God put that conscience in man. But for you, when you're not terrified, it's an evident token of your salvation and in your confidence in what you have in Christ. It's salvation that you already have, not that you will get it because you're not afraid of your adversaries. Okay, so down in verse 12. Okay, Paul uses the word salvation there. And what is he referring to? Well, obviously, it's not getting saved, but it's the salvation that you already possess as your own. It's yours by faith. Okay, so notice again the phrase, work out your own salvation. What does that mean? Okay, first, you can work it out because it's in you. You work it out because it's in you. Give you some examples, okay? Sometimes at work, people have a question for the boss, and because he's in a mood or something, he says, you work it out. You work it out. Do what you're, do what you're hired to do. Right? You work it out. Sometimes a, a group of people are having a conflict amongst themselves, and the boss will say, work it out amongst yourselves and keep me out of it. You work it out. Don't get me involved. And these Philippians may have had the same kinds of situations of things they needed to work out, because look what Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, 
But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Paul never says things unless there's a need in that assembly for what he's saying. When he says something like this, there's a need there. And they've got things they need to work out in their own lives. Obviously, there was strife in the Philippian assembly because some of the people wanted to be recognized. That's why he uses the word vainglory. Vainglory is a bad thing in the body of Christ. So rather than being self-exalting, he says, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's something they needed to work out in their midst as part of their salvation experience in Christ. They needed to work that out. And what he said in verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Obviously there was disputing. Obviously there was arguing among these people. The church at Philippi was a great church for giving to Paul, but sometimes people justify their giving and make excuses for the other things in their life. So the thought of working out tense situations is definitely one of the things that's intended by the Apostle Paul here as part of the salvation that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Work out your salvation by forgiving one another and forbearing one another, like he spoke about in Colossians chapter 3. In other words, work out your salvation is to live out the salvation that you have, especially with others in the, in the body of Christ. It's synonymous with labor. In chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul's going to talk about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, notice in verse 25, chapter 2, verse 25, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, my companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Paul, Epaphroditus is a companion in labor. They're working out their salvation as they go about their business in the ministry. They're working out their salvation. They're doing the things that are part of salvation. Notice what Paul says in Colossians 1.29, Wherefore I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, that's working out your salvation. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith? That's working out your salvation. That's what it means. It's engaging in your salvation. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's working out your salvation. It's working out the salvation that you have. So in Philippians 2.12, Paul says, work out your own salvation. And then he's going to give examples in Philippians chapter 2 of working out your salvation. New, verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputings. That's walking in humility, lowliness of mind, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, forgive that person. That's living out your salvation in forgiveness and forbearance. And why would you do that? That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. That's working out your salvation. That's exercising the prerogatives and privileges of the salvation that you have in Christ. This is exercising the truth of the doctrines that are within you. And notice one of the reasons, one of the reasons that Paul writes this, that we work out our salvation in verse 16, is that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. There's something waiting at the end of the journey for Paul himself. He wants to rejoice that you have worked out the details of your salvation in your lives. He wants to rejoice. In, notice it's at, in the day of Christ. The day of Christ. Christ. 
The day of Christ, as we have spoken of before, begins with the catching away of the body of Christ. This is the day of Christ. The day of the Lord begins on the earth at the same time. The day of Christ is here. This is where the judgment seat of Christ will happen. The day of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ will happen in heaven while the day of the Lord, Daniel's 70th week, is transpiring on the earth. That's when it happens. Paul says he wants to rejoice during this time in the day of Christ. He wants to rejoice during that time that we worked out the prerogatives of our salvation. Notice something else he says in verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What in the world does that mean? I'm standing in the grace of God. What do I have to fear? What do I have to tremble for? Well, obviously this ha looks like it has to do with the future prospect of being at the judgment seat of Christ. Even when it has to do in this world with empl employers, Paul's going to talk about that. Paul uses similar language as this. Notice, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Paul is cognizant of the fact that when we do things in this world, we do it as unto Christ. And if you're working out the details and your salvation, even in your job, you do it as unto Christ, and that's why you do it with fear and trembling, not because of sin, but because of the Christian forgiveness. And I'm talk, I really talk a lot about the forgiveness because that is the issue with modern man, is the inability to forgive. It's a huge problem. Even in the body of Christ, it's a huge problem. When you exercise the prerogatives of your salvation, when you are working out your salvation, he that hath begun a good work in you, he saved you, he justified you by faith, and now the word of God is working effectually in them that believe, it's working in you, and you then you work that out of you. You work out those doctrines, especially forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any man, forgive him. As Christ forgave him, so you forgive him. As Christ forgave you, so you forgive him. That's working out your salvation. So knowing that, you know, I do believe all human beings have failed in this regard with their employers. Who has rendered perfect obedience to their employers in the past? I sure didn't. That's why in 1990, after being in the workforce, I decided to become self-employed because I did not want to work for people who placed un the most, I don't even know what word I'm looking for, the most foolish requirements upon me and make people do the most stupid things that have nothing to do with their job, but just, just the, the, the things they want you to do. I said, I can't do this. I can't do this my whole life. Some of you work in places where they want you to do things that you know you're not supposed to be doing them. There's things that are done in this world that aren't, aren't right. You know, but you do it because that your boss says to do it, ultimately he's responsible. If some of you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Those of you who have to be in the workforce, then you need to do this. If you can be in the workforce, then you need to do that, as unto Christ. But notice in his own life, his own responsibility before the Lord, 
And I, brethren, when I came to you, speaking to the church at Corinth, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom. I was working out my salvation. I was exercising the prerogatives of my salvation. I was doing what my salvation that I had in Christ required of me to do. And so I didn't do it with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He was not in fear and trembling because of the people he was preaching to. He was in fear and trembling because he was preach, representing Christ in the city of Corinth, and he had to do that as unto Christ. He knows that his words and his actions will be weighed in the balance at the judgment seat of Christ. Now here's a man who was inspired to write and do what he did infallibly. And he still did it in much fear and trembling as unto Christ. So when he writes to the body of Christ in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, it's not fear and trembling that we might lose our salvation. It's fear and trembling that we do the right thing as much lieth in us so that we can be approved at the judgment seat of Christ. I've said it many times, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Those who don't rightly divide the word of truth today, those who handle the word of God deceitfully, those who don't do work out their salvation according to the Pauline pattern of godly edification will one day stand at the judgment seat of Christ and they will be ashamed. And it all has to do with the word of God. It's not about your sin can't be about your sin. Ephesians 1, 7 said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's what we have in Christ. We have forgiveness of sins. It's not about sin at the judgment seat of Christ. It can't be. It's about service. And are we working out the prerogatives of the salvation that we have in Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, contrary to the popular opinion of those who think you can lose your salvation, is not talking about working for your salvation, working to keep your salvation, or ultimately working to get your salvation. All three of those are wrong. Working out your salvation because God has worked something in you and is working effectually in you. And therefore, there is something to work out of us. And I can tell you that working out your salvation and learning the doctrines in the, in the dispensation of grace and how we live out the life in the dispensation of grace is a progressive process. It does not happen overnight. Amen? Does Philippians 2.12 teach that you can lose your salvation? Yes? Oh, oh, you said no. Okay, I'm joking. I heard that. That's right. What we have in Christ, you know when Paul says you're complete in Christ? <laughs> you're complete in Christ. You know? So what are you doing with the word of God that you have? Are you working out your salvation? Some, there's some people that probably think it's only about your obedience to this and your obedience to that and, and what you do and what you don't do. And I'm going to tell you that it's something far more important than that. It's what you do with the Word of God. That's the most important thing.
What are you doing with this book? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this morning that we can open the scripture and that we can compare spiritual things with spiritual. And we can look at what the word of God says, not in one, from one verse, but from its context to give us an understanding. So I thank you this morning. I pray that anyone who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior today will just recognize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that God sent Jesus Christ to pay for our sin. And by simple faith, in looking at that cross and the death and the burial and the resurrection and believing that that happened for you, you have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.